The more strange new worlds you explore, the more new life and new civilizations you seek out, the further you boldly go, the more it dawns on you that the real Star Trek was the friends you made along the way. Star Trek has taken many forms over the years, and its history is filled with compelling characters. If it wasn't, that history would almost certainly not be as long and as ongoing as it is. And sometimes, some of those characters hit it off with each other and become buddies, chums, pals, friends, best friends, best friends forever, or BFFs, as the kids used to say. And now pretty much everyone says, because the kids who started saying it grew up and passed it down to their kids, like a cleft chin or an elevated risk of developing heart disease, Star Trek is positively bursting with BFFs. So many that it seems only natural to ask, who are actually Star Trek's greatest BFFs? It's a tough question to answer definitively, both because the Star Trek franchise includes so many memorable friendships between characters, and because it's a matter of opinion and therefore can have no definitive answer. But that's no reason not to be systematic about this. Let us begin where Star Trek began. With Star Trek. And I'm sorry, but... Before I get into this too far, I just want to remind everyone that the purpose of this video is to talk about Star Trek and have fun and give me the opportunity to tell lots of hilarious jokes and maybe also make one or two good points if there's time. The purpose is not to list every single example of best friends we have ever seen across almost 60 years of Star Trek. I'm going to try to get to the important ones, the ones I'm interested in, the ones I think most of you will be interested in, the ones that it would be weird for me to leave out, but if your favorite Trek BFFs are like, I don't know, that little girl and her creepy imaginary friend who became real thanks to an alien who wanted to better understand humanity from that one episode of TNG, try not to take it personally if I don't cover them, which I definitely won't, okay? Thank you. As members of the online fan community of a popular sci-fi fantasy franchise, I know I can count on you all to be reasonable and understanding and not weird or obsessive or pedantic about this. Now, where was I? Oh, yes! Star Trek. The original Star Trek is less of an ensemble piece than any of the spin-offs that followed it. It had a very strong cast of characters, played by distinctive, memorable, and more than capable actors, but the action was almost always focused around one of three characters. Captain Kirk, the series lead, Spock, the second lead, and Dr. McCoy, the third lead. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy form the central trio of classic Trek, but they aren't just united by the show's dramatic structure. Their characters are depicted as close friends. They have a bit of a three-way BFF thing going, but they can also be paired off in various combinations, each of which has its own collective personality. Kirk and McCoy give the impression of old friends, guys who have known each other for years and share a bond of mutual trust and affection. McCoy also functions as Kirk's conscience, reminding him of his responsibilities to others and to himself. Spock and McCoy are classic frenemies. Their exchanges are sharp and sarcastic. They usually find themselves on opposite sides of an argument, McCoy taking the emotional angle, while Spock proceeds in strict accordance with the tenets of logic, or so he says. But beneath the bickering, which occasionally blows up into outright hostility, each man also clearly harbors a deep respect for the other. But, come on, Kirk and McCoy are great, Spock and McCoy are a guarantee of time well spent in front of the TV, but if the subject at hand is best friends in Star Trek, the only pairing from classic Trek we absolutely need to talk about is Kirk and Spock. Whether they're the greatest is a matter of opinion, but they are without a doubt the original, and in many ways, the definitive BFFs of Star Trek. There's an implied closeness between the two almost from the beginning, a product of how frequently they, as the first and second leads, are placed side by side in episodes, but the depth of their friendship becomes clearer the longer the series goes on. In The Naked Time, the fourth episode ever broadcast, Spock, under the intoxicating influence of polywater molecules, there's a prepositional phrase that makes sense in exactly one context, confesses to Kirk his feelings of friendship and also of the shame that goes along with those feelings. 
Spock, raised according to the customs of the Vulcan side of his family, has been conditioned to reject emotion, to suppress it, to tightly control it. But his feelings of friendship for Kirk always seem to find their way out somehow. There are numerous examples of this throughout the series, but the most overt is in the second season premiere, A Mock Time. There's that great ending where Spock returns to the Enterprise, believing he's just killed Captain Kirk in ritual combat down on Vulcan. He reports to sickbay to inform Dr. McCoy that he intends to relinquish command of the Enterprise to Scotty and turn himself over to the authorities. Then Kirk, who isn't really dead but had merely been secretly drugged by McCoy, casually walks in from the other room. And Spock is so overjoyed to see him that he grabs Kirk by the shoulders, spins him around, and exclaims with the biggest, happiest Leonard Nimoy horse grin you ever saw, Captain Jim! He pulls himself together immediately and tries to play it off as his logical reaction to Kirk's survival, but McCoy knows better. And so do we. In the movie Star Trek II, Spock gives his life to save the rest of the crew, and has a heartbreaking death scene with Kirk, where he declares his everlasting friendship. Then, in Star Trek III, Kirk risks everything for Spock, ultimately leading to Spock's resurrection, and an ending that sees Spock, still a bit foggy from the whole being dead thing, recognize his old friend, saying tentatively but hopefully, Jim. Your name is Jim. That's followed by Star Trek IV, where the two of them are practically inseparable, and Star Trek V, where Spock rescues Kirk from the vengeance of an angry god. Kirk is so overcome with emotion that he goes in for a hug, only for Spock to beg off with the timeless line, Captain, please, not in front of the Klingons. I mean... I don't want to declare Kirk and Spock Star Trek's greatest BFFs because that would make the rest of this video pretty anticlimactic if the very first set of BFFs I talk about walk away with the title, in my judgment anyway, why BFF MMV, but those two are going to be tough to beat. There's best friends, and then there's they got their own Hallmark ornament best friends. If there's any other set of BFFs that can beat those BFFs in a BFF off, it's these two. It's time to move on from the original series to the next generation. And when the subject is best friends aboard the Enterprise D, there's no place to start other than with Data and Geordi. Which is not to say there are no other candidates on TNG. Dr. Crusher and Counselor Troy seem to be close. They're workout buddies, at least. Commander Riker and Lieutenant Worf were presented as being good friends, at least up to a point. After Season 2, the writers mostly forgot about that, though they did get back to it briefly in Season 5, when Worf was injured by a falling plastic barrel and yearned for death. There's also Captain Picard and Dr. Crusher. True, whenever we got a Picard and Crusher episode, it leaned into their romantic feelings for each other, but their relationship remained platonic through the course of the series. They went to each other for advice, they had breakfast together on the regular, and Crusher was one of Picard's most trusted confidants. You could throw Riker and Troy in there too if you wanted, since they were shown to be longtime and intimate friends as well, and I do mean intimate because they were obviously hooking up, like, the entire time. Which, hey, I'm not saying BFFs can't hook up, I'm just saying BFFs who regularly hook up are in more of a best friends with benefits arrangement, and this video is about BFFs, not BFWBs. Let's maintain focus. Is it possible Data and Geordi were also secretly hooking up? Sure, I guess, but the show itself never leads us in that direction. Unless you consider role-playing as Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson to be a form of sexual intercourse, which... <sighs> Actually, maybe I do. I don't know. Never mind. Practically speaking, the pairing makes sense. Geordi is shown to be technically and mechanically skilled, and Data is a robot man, so Geordi can help Data out with upgrades and routine maintenance. Given that... It only makes sense that they would form a close bond. They must be spending a lot of time together. You know how long an oil change takes. And they have a lot in common. They're both giant nerds, with rare exceptions. Neither one of them is getting laid. And beginning in season two, their uniforms are even the same color. They're practically twinsies. The writers of TNG established and re-established Data and Geordi's friendship by testing it, by threatening to split them up so that we would all feel sad about it. I could call this kind of writing ham-fisted and manipulative, but hey, it worked! 
In the measure of a man, when it looks like Data is either going to leave Starfleet or be forcibly transferred from the Enterprise to become a science experiment under the authority of Commander Bruce Maddox, the crew throws Data a going-away party in 10 Forward. Jordy is so bummed about the prospect of Data leaving that he can't even participate. He just sits moping by himself in a corner. Is something wrong? Data asks. Of course there is, Jordy says. You're going away. It's dust in here, in the air. So much dust. Their friendship was tested again in Season 3 in the episode The Most Toys. This time, Geordi wasn't sad that Data was going to leave the Enterprise. He was sad that Data was dead, or it seemed. Unscrupulous trader and collector of rare items Kivas Fajo stages a shuttle explosion to deceive the Enterprise crew into believing Data has been killed so he can add Data to his collection. For a short while, it seems like Fajo might get away with it. If we ignore the conventions of episodic action-adventure television, I mean. But Fajo doesn't count on the power of Geordi's friendship, and more specifically, the power of Geordi's obsessively comprehensive knowledge of Data's professional habits. When Geordi realizes that Data's final communication from the shuttle before it exploded did not follow protocol to the letter, it leads to the unraveling of Fajo's entire plot and the eventual rescue of Data. The roles are reversed in Season 5, when Geordi appears to die, along with Ensign Rowe, in a transporter accident. Geordi and Rowe are still alive, but in a phased state that renders them invisible to everyone other than themselves and a Romulan guy who is also phased. Data, along with everyone else on the Enterprise, spends most of the episode believing that Geordi is dead, and, as Geordi's best friend, takes responsibility for organizing a memorial service. When speaking to Worf about what that service should be like, Data puts his relationship with Geordi into words. I never knew what a friend was until I met Geordi, Data says. He spoke to me as though I were human. He treated me no differently from anyone else. He accepted me for what I am, and that, I have learned, is friendship. But I do not know how to say goodbye. <laughs> and Jordy and Ro were there too, and they were invisible, and Jordy could hear what Data said about him. <laughs> but Data didn't know. Why is it so dusty in here? Fans are so attached to Jordy and Data's friendship, some of them, I can't personally relate, <laughs> that Many were pissed about the first season of Star Trek Picard because Geordi wasn't in it. And look, there were plenty of things not to like about Picard season one and the Picard series overall, but it's truly a testament to how beloved Geordi and Data are as a pair that when the creators of that series decided to make Picard's grief over the death of Data the emotional center of the first season, more than a few Trekkies, including my BFF, Jason Harding, reacted by indignantly insisting that should be Geordi! As though Picard had somehow stolen Geordi's show. Only Geordi may mourn Data, how dare you, sir! Those fans got what they wanted eventually, though. In the work of professional wish-fulfillment fanfic that was Picard Season 3, we get this scene where Data's personality has been transplanted into a new body, only to be suppressed by that of lore, and Geordi tries to reach Data by tearfully confessing to his friend how devastated he was by his death and how much he misses him. That's a good... Nice little piece of business. Well acted. <laughs> Continuing our chronological survey of BFFs throughout the Star Trek franchise, let's leave TNG behind and move on to the series that followed it, Star Trek Voyager. Yes, Star Trek Voyager, the series that came right after TNG. That's what I said, that's what I meant to say, I'm definitely not forgetting anything. Voyager presents us with a few possibilities for best BFFs, or BBFFs, if you will. Captain Janeway is close with both First Officer Chakotay and Security Chief Tuvok. Tuvok and Neelix have an antagonistic rapport, but there are indications that a friendlier connection lies beneath. And hey, in one episode, they're practically inseparable most of one episode, but when we're talking Voyager and BFFs, we're really talking about these guys, Tom Paris 
and Harry Kim. They meet in the series pilot, they hit it off right away, and oh, the adventures they have together. My goodness, all those memorable Tom and Harry episodes that have etched themselves forever on the walls of our hearts. Episodes like The Shoot! Ha ha ha! Who could forget that unadulterated classic? Not me! That's the episode I was going to say all along. This phone doesn't even work, see? It's just a prop. I was acting. Originally airing early in season three of Voyager, the shoot sees Tom and Harry wrongfully convicted of an act of terrorism by the Akrotarians and sent to a maximum security prison at the bottom of, get this, a shoot. There are no other ways in or out of the prison besides the chute, through which new prisoners are deposited and food is delivered. Climbing up through the chute to the surface is the only possible route of escape, but the chute is protected by a force field. And there's another complication. Prisoners here are implanted with devices called clamps that affect their personalities, making them short-tempered and prone to violence. Tom and Harry try to devise a way to deactivate the force field while struggling to concentrate through the effects of the clamps and dealing with threats from their fellow prisoners. And through all of this, they have to lean on each other. Tom is seriously injured in a fight, and Harry becomes his protector, flipping their typical big brother, little brother dynamic. This man is my friend, Harry declares to the others. Nobody touches him. Harry successfully turns off the force field at one point and climbs all the way up to the top of the chute, only to discover that the prison, which they thought was located underground, is actually a spaceship. The only thing at the top of the chute is a hatch where ships can dock to deliver food and new prisoners. This discovery represents something of a setback to their escape plans due to the fact that, in the words of Tom Servo, you can't tunnel through space. You know what I mean. Eventually, the stress of the situation, amplified by the clamps in their heads, gets to Tom and Harry, and they turn on each other. Harry discovers that Tom, delirious from blood loss, has disassembled the gadget they invented to deactivate the force field and furiously attacks him. Harry nearly kills Tom, but stops himself. And not long after that, Voyager arrives, and Janeway and Tuvok slide down the chute to the rescue. Back on the ship, Harry apologizes to Tom for their fight, but Tom tells him no apology is necessary. All I'm going to remember is you standing in front of me and saying, this man is my friend. Nobody touches him. That's friendship. That's loyalty. Loyalty which Tom rewards by making Harry his sidekick when they play Captain Proton in the holodeck. You need someone you can trust. That doesn't just go for when you dress up and play make-believe either. It goes for real life too. Just ask Captain Jonathan Archer. His best friend, Commander Trip Tucker, isn't just his BFF. He's his right-hand man. Like the series I've already covered, there are more than one notable pair of friends on Enterprise, but Archer and Trip are the resident BFFs of that show from the first episode. Unlike Geordi and Data or Tom and Harry, Archer and Trip don't meet when they are assigned to their show's hero ship. They've known each other for years, and it's clear from the beginning that Archer has chosen Trip to be the foundation of this Enterprise's crew. He also probably chose Trip because he knew there was a long exploratory mission ahead and he wanted his best buddy along for the ride. Over the course of the Enterprise series, we see Archer and Trip doing all the typical best friend stuff. They share meals together, they watch sports together, one helps the other survive crossing an alien desert, one rescues the other from a Tellarite bounty hunter who intends to turn him over to the Klingons BFF shit, you know. The creators of Enterprise give us a glimpse at how Archer and Tripp's friendship began in the flashback episode First Flight, which depicts Archer's time as a Starfleet test pilot back when the engine that would eventually power Enterprise, the engine based on designs by Archer's father, was still being developed. In the aftermath of the accidental loss of a test vehicle, Starfleet Command, caving to pressure from the Vulcans, decides to halt the program and start over from scratch, scrapping Archer's father's engine in favor of designing a new one. Following the loss of the test vehicle, Trip, at this point a lieutenant assigned to the engineering team, inserts himself into an argument between Admiral Forrest, a Vulcan observer, test pilot A.G. Robinson, and Archer. Archer and Robinson are rivals. 
They both want to be the first pilot to fly faster than Warp 2. When Robinson is given the assignment, Archer is so bummed out that the waitress at the bar that night takes notice and asks him what's wrong. He tells her, and she says, Well, won't they need a pilot for the second test flight? And Archer says, Do you remember what Buzz Aldrin said when he stepped on the moon? Magnificent desolation. He said magnificent desolation. And just so I'm making myself clear, I didn't look that up when I was writing the script for this. I didn't need to look it up. I knew it. I've known it since I was a child. I don't claim to be an expert on the space program. I'm not a scholar. I'm not an historian. But I know a thing or two. And one thing I know is what Buzz Aldrin's goddamn first words on the goddamn moon were. And they were magnificent desolation. Which coincidentally, is also an accurate description of how I felt when I learned that Buzz Aldrin is a Republican. Oh, I hate it when Steve brings up politics. I just want to hear him talk about Star Trek. Fuck you! Magnificent desolation. So anyway, Tripp insists that, despite what the Vulcan guy says, the engine is not flawed. It's just that they're still working out the kinks is all. They've never tried going this fast or had to fly it using this amount of fuel before. This is the first meeting of Archer and Trip, and because Trip stepped up to defend the engine designed by Archer's father, Archer instantly decides Trip is his best friend for life. To say that Archer has some lingering daddy issues is a bit of an understatement. We all love our dads. Well, most of us. But Archer is so devoted to defending his father's memory that if you ran into Archer at the mall and went up to him and said, oh, hey, Jonathan, right? Yeah. I met your father once. He seemed like a good dude. Archer would probably pledge himself to fight by your side like Morgan Freeman to Kevin Costner in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or as I call it, the best Robin Hood movie. He might even say yes if you asked him to help you move, which I know sounds absurd on its face, but I'm telling you, that dude fucking reveres his father. Trip helps Archer and Robinson carry out a successful, unauthorized flight of another test vehicle to prove there's nothing wrong with the engine design, thus convincing Starfleet not to halt the program after all, and yada yada yada. A few years later, Archer's the captain of the Enterprise, and Trip's the chief engineer, and the third guy is dead. Speaking of dead people, Trip! He sacrifices himself to save Archer, and the rest of the ship too, I guess, but mostly Archer. It happens in the series finale. These are the voyages. A gang of aliens boards the ship looking for Archer's frenemy, Shran. Archer and Trip confront them in the corridor, and when the alien leader orders one of his goons to kill Archer, Trip steps in and offers to take them to Shran if they spare Archer's life. So they knock Archer unconscious instead of killing him, and Trip lures them into a room where he pretends to be disabling the security system when actually he's doing a thing that triggers an explosion that takes out all of the aliens and himself. He gets to share a final look with his BFF Archer before being shoved into a medical tube in sickbay, and sometime not long after that, he dies. It was the last episode. The producers had already picked a kinda sorta natural endpoint by having it build up to the signing of a charter to formalize an alliance between worlds that will eventually lead to the formation of the Federation, but I guess they wanted to really pull out all the stops for a memorable series finale by killing off a beloved character. Then they went too far and made the entire thing take place inside a holodeck program during an episode of TNG so they could have Riker and Troy be in it too. You see what happens when you make the demands of the story secondary to cramming in gratuitous legacy characters? Do you? What comes after Enterprise? Discovery? Ba ba ba, not so fast. Let's not forget the Kelvin timeline films, Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. They've got some BFFs, too, and they aren't just younger, sexier, more action-forward versions of the same ones from the original series. The Kelvin versions of Kirk and Spock become friends eventually, but they're not as close as classic Kirk and Spock. However, Kelvin, Kirk, and McCoy do seem like the bestest of buddies. They meet on the shuttle to the Academy. McCoy helps Kirk sneak aboard the Enterprise before the first big battle with Nero. In Star Trek Beyond, it's McCoy with whom Kirk shares a drink on his birthday, the birthday that makes Kirk older than his father was when he died. And let's not forget the booze they drink in that scene is some stuff McCoy swiped out of Chekhov's locker, stealing someone else's booze so you can get drunk with your buddy and listen to him be sad about his dead dad. That's some BFF shit. 
The Kelvin films also have Scotty and Keenzer, who spent a very long time alone together on an isolated Starfleet installation and now seem absolutely devoted to one another. I don't know the whole story. I'm not asking for the whole story. Whatever they have between them seems to work for them. I'm going to assume it's a platonic thing, but whatever it is, I wish them all the happiness in the world, and I'm so glad they found each other on the same planet where Spock Prime randomly found Kirk. And then they both randomly found Scotty, who just so happened to be stationed a few miles away. It's the Finding People planet. Now moving on to Disco, I think the only serious BBFF candidates we have are Burnham and Saru. They have their ups and downs, especially in season one. <laughs> the whole show had its ups and downs that season, didn't it? And in all the other seasons, but never as bone-jarring as in that first one. A Star Trek spinoff with a crummy first season. You give the fan base the nostalgia bait they say they want, and then they don't even appreciate it. Burnham and Saru start off as disagreeable colleagues, serving under Captain Giorgio on the USS Shenjo. Then Burnham goes rogue to try and prevent a war with the Klingons, and winds up starting a war instead. Kinda. Not really, but she gets blamed for it. And then finds herself as an unranked science officer on the Starship Discovery, following her court-martial and some time spent in the interplanetary big house. And wouldn't you know it, Saru is the first officer on Discovery! Saru is wary of Burnham for her role in inciting the war with the Klingons, and he blames her for the death of Captain Giorgio, and they find themselves on opposing sides of an ethical dilemma involving using a living being, specifically a giant space tardigrade, to operate the ship's experimental spore drive. So they're not so chummy at the start of the series. But as time goes on, they work together, Saru comes to trust Burnham, Burnham's respect for Saru increases as he grows from a reliable officer into a leader, and before you know it, they're like family. In season two, when Saru thinks he's about to die because he's entering death puberty, he turns to Burnham for support. They reveal the true depth of their feelings for each other. Burnham tells Saru that he is her family. And Saru tells Burnham that she is the only one who truly knows him, that she is like a sister to him, which is a big deal for Saru to say, because he has a sister back on his home planet that he was really close to, who he hasn't seen since he left to join Starfleet. Seeking more than emotional support, Saru asks for Burnham's help to end his suffering. Kelpian death puberty ends in violent insanity, and I'd like to avoid that, Saru tells her. So before I get to that point, can you kill me? Burnham's like, sure. Fortunately, it doesn't come to that, since it turns out Kelpian death puberty is a myth created by the evil monster people who have enslaved Saru's species. Saru doesn't go bonkers and die, he just loses the little tendrils on the back of his head and becomes less of a great big pants-pissing crybaby. It's a good thing! And following that experience, Saru and Burnham are bonded for life. BFL! Which is just another way of saying BFF! Saru asks Burnham to come with him back to his home planet to tell everyone the truth about death puberty, and between the two of them, they even manage to free Saru's people from the murderous exploitation of those scary monster people. After Discovery arrives in the 32nd century in the show's third season, Saru becomes the captain of the ship, and Burnham his first officer. When Saru is forced to remove Burnham from the post after she takes off on an unauthorized mission, he is deeply grieved by the act, as is Burnham, but she reassures him that he's doing the right thing. When someone fires you and they're so torn up over it that you start trying to comfort them, that's true friendship. Or emotional abuse, but Saru didn't do her like that. In Season 4, when Burnham takes over as Captain of Discovery, Saru, who still holds the rank of Captain himself, returns to serve as her first officer. It's an act of loyalty, of friendship, on Saru's part. He could be commanding his own ship, or performing some diplomatic role for Starfleet or the Federation, but he wants to be there for Burnham. The evolution of Burnham and Saru's friendship is an example of long-term storytelling and character development, something which Discovery has been rightfully criticized for not doing very well. I love Discovery. I am a fan of the show, but I have always acknowledged how flawed and frustratingly uneven it can be. The one thing about Discovery that has always worked is the dynamic between Burnham and Saru. 
Their journey from adversaries to surrogate siblings remains one of the most satisfying and compelling elements of the series as it prepares to release its final season later this year. After Discovery comes Lower Decks. Well, technically after Discovery comes Star Trek Picard, but who are the BFFs in that? Rios and Raffi? Riker and Picard, sort of? Raffi and Worf in Season 3? That might be stretching it. So, Lower Decks. The lead foursome are all BFFs with each other in various combinations. They're all loud and excitable and adorable, and they love and support each other. And whenever one of them starts to experience a crisis of confidence, one of the others will step up to remind them how amazing they are. This happens at least three or four times per season, because it's the only form of characterization the writers of the show seem to know how to do. I'm worried I might not be awesome enough. No way, dude! You are the most awesome person ever! You're right! I'm gonna stop doubting myself and embrace my awesomeness! TNG reference? I get that TNG reference! Lower decks! Lower decks! But even on this show, where it's exuberant, hyper-positive best friends everywhere you look, there is one particular set of BFFs that stands out for me, and it's Rutherford and Tendi. Sure, Boimler and Mariner are besties, and Boimler and Rutherford are besties, and Mariner and Tendi are besties, but only Rutherford and Tendi's bestie status has become a defining characteristic of them both. One episode has an entire subplot about Rutherford quitting the engineering division and looking for another job on the ship just so he can have time to watch a cool space thing with Tendi. Rutherford also creates a holodeck program to teach Tendi how to spacewalk, a program that includes a virtual assistant named Badgie who subsequently goes nuts and tries to kill them both because holodeck. Rutherford ultimately snaps Badgie's neck, and if you're willing to snap an anthropomorphized Starfleet Delta's neck with your bare hands to protect someone, I'd say... I don't know, I guess you must care about them a little. They take an immense delight in each other's presence, they never tire of spending time together, and we're supposed to be sad when they're separated. BFFs! Star Trek Prodigy's first season, which is excellent, by the way. You should totally watch it if you haven't already. It's on Netflix now here in the States. Anyway, Prodigy's first season is built around the principal characters getting to know each other and learning to trust each other and bond as a team. And there really isn't an obvious BFF pairing. The closest is Rock Talk and Murph, who are a duo when the core group first assembles. Rock Talk is like, hi, this is Murph, and he's coming along too. And no one else is quite sure who or what Murph is. Is he Rock's pet? It soon becomes apparent that Murph is a person, intelligent and with a will of his own, and so he and Rock are friends. Rock seems to understand Murph on a deeper, more intuitive level than the others, and some of the sweetest moments of the first season are when she's worried about Murph, or proud of Murph for saving the day, usually by eating something inappropriate at a useful time. Murph could give Baby Yoda a run for his money in that department. They make a good pair! They're funny and adorable, they each undergo actual character development through the course of the season, and I would, in fact, be sad if they were separated. BFFs! Now we come to my favorite of the current slate of Star Trek shows, Strange New Worlds. And even though the cast is packed with likable characters, played by charismatic actors, and a bunch of them are reinterpretations of legacy characters borrowed from the original series, and we've established multiple friendships among the group, in terms of BFFs like Ride or Die, Bestest of Best Friends, our considerations begin and end with Captain Pike in number one. Just like Kirk and Spock before them, or after them, depending on how you look at it, in times of trouble, Pike and Number One turn to one another. They tell each other things they don't tell anyone else, or before they tell anyone else. When Pike is shaken by the revelation that in the future he will suffer a debilitating accident and be confined to a beep chair, unable to move or speak, he confides in Number One. And it's number one who encourages him to explore the possibility that his fate isn't etched in stone. It's learning that number one has gotten herself into a jam on an alien planet that pulls Pike out of seclusion and back aboard the Enterprise at the start of the series. When number one confides in Pike about her secret history of being genetically engineered and offers to resign from Starfleet, Pike puts his own career on the line by insisting that she remain on the ship and promising to fight for her should it ever come to that. And when it does come to that, 
At the end of the first season and the beginning of the second, Pike travels alone to a planet in a distant nebula where he can't even breathe the air in order to recruit the best possible lawyer to defend Number One at her court-martial. And when Number One emerges from that court-martial with her Starfleet career intact, Captain Pike seems genuinely relieved to see her and welcomes her back to the Enterprise with a big hug. Duh. I can make fun of it, but in all seriousness, that bit chokes me up when I watch it. And if it doesn't inspire some similar emotional reaction in you, I can only conclude that there are bodies in your crawl space that you put there, because only a cold-blooded serial killer would be unmoved by that moment. I think that just about does it. I've covered every version of Star Trek, presented my choices for the most important or memorable best friends in each, which means the only thing left is to choose which. BFFs are the greatest. Do you hear that? Boys? My boys? I didn't forget, I was acting again. How am I gonna do a video about best friends in Star Trek and not talk about Deep Space Nine? Hell with that, not end on Deep Space Nine. The most character driven, the deepest, pun intended, there's nothing you can do, and the best of all the Star Trek shows, DS9 has also got memorable BFFs hanging from its lower pylons. And I guess they could be hanging from the upper pylons, too. It doesn't really make a difference. They are in space. There's Dax and Kira. There's Worf and Martok. There's Odo and Quark, the sworn enemies who are secretly BFFs. There's Odo and Kira, the BFFs who fall in love and become girlfriend and goo friend. There's Jake and Nog, the BFFs who grow from teenage troublemakers to upstanding adults right before our eyes and help each other get there. And the list goes on. But who am I trying to kid? And for Christ's sake, haven't we been here long enough already? The signature BFFs of Deep Space Nine and my runaway no contest choice for Star Trek's greatest BFFs are Chief O'Brien and Dr. Bashir. They check all the boxes Star Trek establishes that BFFs in this franchise ought to check. They trust each other. They'd rather spend time with each other than with pretty much anyone else. They drink together. They argue, but they always make up. And most importantly, just like every other pair of Star Trek BFFs, even the ones I haven't talked about or mentioned only briefly, they love to play dress up together. Seriously, all Star Trek BFFs do that. Except Rutherford and Tendi. They build models together, the fucking dorks. Little model starships. Can you imagine? More importantly, O'Brien and Bashir epitomize how to write a friendship between two characters and how to use that friendship to drive long-term character development in a series. Not only are they not friends when Deep Space Nine begins, they don't really like each other. Or... More precisely, O'Brien doesn't like Bashir. Understandable, season one Bashir isn't a very likable character. He's brash, arrogant, presumptuous, extremely talkative, and oblivious to how much the others hate hearing him talk. He's just a lot. But the more O'Brien gets to know him, the more adventures they have and survive together in such episodes as season one's The Storyteller and season two's Armageddon Game and season four's Hippocratic Oath, the more O'Brien comes to like Bashir, and the more likable Bashir becomes to us, because we're shown more sides to his personality, more depth to him than was initially apparent, and he becomes a more well-rounded and fully realized character. Likewise, Bashir reveals additional dimensions to O'Brien. As a traditional everyman, working-class hero type, O'Brien isn't typically one to talk about his innermost feelings, even with his wife, Keiko, at least not that we see very often. But with Bashir, O'Brien opens up. 
O'Brien talks to Bashir about his insecurities regarding his marriage, about the difficulties of being a parent, about how much he misses Keiko and their daughter Molly when they leave for a long-term project on Bajor, and also about how guilty he feels for missing the freedom he had when they were gone after they come back. There's a wonderful scene between the two of them from the episode Explorers near the end of DS9's third season. It's the scene where they sing Jerusalem as you heard a few minutes ago. They're drunk. Bashir is depressed because an old rival of his from medical school is on the station, and he was hoping to impress her, but instead she apparently just blew him off. O'Brien speculates that she ignored Bashir either because she's in love with him or she hates his guts, because with Bashir, there's no in-between. People either love him or hate him. When Bashir presses O'Brien to elaborate, O'Brien says, Well, I mean, I hated you when we met, but now, I don't. Bashir is moved. That means a lot to me, Chief, he says. That's from the heart, O'Brien assures him. I really do not hate you anymore. It's written and played as a humorous scene, and it is, poking fun at that weird reluctance so many of us men, especially us cis-hetero men, have when it comes to expressing love for other men. But it's also a moment of vulnerability from O'Brien. He's telling Bashir, indirectly but obviously, that he loves him. And it means something to Bashir, who clearly feels the same way about O'Brien. They're constantly taking the piss out of each other in the fearlessly cutting way that only true friends can do, but... They do sometimes have more serious disagreements. The aforementioned episode Hippocratic Oath finds them profoundly at odds with one another over what to do about a group of rogue Jem'Hadar who have asked for help in breaking their addiction to the drug the founders used to control them. That episode ends with Bashir extremely pissed at O'Brien for the way things ended up going down. They even cancel their regular darts game at Quark's. But Bashir closes the show by suggesting that maybe they can pick up the darts game in a few days. Disagreement, anger, disappointment, and no nice, neat resolution by the time the end credits roll, but always the trust that when the harsh feelings fade, the friendship will still be there. It's not always an argument or a fight that tests a friendship. Trauma, personal trauma, trauma not shared between friends, can do that too. O'Brien experiences that in the episode Hard Time, when false memories of a 20-year prison sentence drive him to the point of taking his own life. It's Bashir who steps in to talk O'Brien off of that metaphorical ledge, and it's a mark of how strongly established their friendship is by this point in the series that it would feel wrong if it were anyone but Bashir with O'Brien in that scene. There are other options, it could be Keiko, his wife. It could be Captain Sisko, O'Brien's commanding officer and the lead protagonist of the series. It could be Worf, who has known O'Brien the longest of anyone else on the series, having served with him on the Enterprise previously. But for that scene to be everything it needs to be, it has to be Bashir, who asks O'Brien not to go through with what he's planning to use that phaser for. It has to be Bashir who reaches into the darkness that has surrounded O'Brien, who tells him, you've been through a terrible experience and you've done or remember doing things you're ashamed of, but despite it all, you are a good person and you don't deserve to die. It's important to have someone, maybe more than one, but at least one, someone in your life who isn't your family who didn't live in your house with you, who doesn't owe you anything according to tradition or convention, someone who chose to be at your side or who was deposited at your side by fate and chose to stay even though they didn't have to. Because there may come a time when you'll need that person to tell you that you're not as bad as you think you are. That's who a best friend can be. The series finale of Deep Space Nine, What You Leave Behind, is not the best final episode of the franchise, not the best written, not the most elegantly structured, not necessarily the ideal culminating statement on the series as a whole, but for fans of the show, it still packs a wallop because its emotional core is built around the concept of saying goodbye. That last hug between O'Brien and Bashir, it gets me. It's not even a scene, really, just a shot. No dialogue, no words passing between them. Just a parting moment between best friends. They're splitting up, and I feel sad about it. It works. 
That actually brings me around to the last set of BFFs I wanted to talk about. Ben Sisko, commanding officer of DS9, and Jadzia Dax, science officer and joined Trill, which basically means she has the memories of multiple lifetimes because there's a super old slug living in her belly and sharing her consciousness. And her slug's previous host was Sisko's mentor. Isn't Star Trek neat? Sisko and Dax are not Star Trek's greatest BFFs. For me, O'Brien and Bashir walk away with that title. Should we commission championship belts for them, you think? Modeled after the old WWF tag team titles, the ones they used from the mid-80s to the early 2000s, I love those belts. I miss those belts. My wistful remembrance of retired title belts of the World Wrestling Federation is not the point. The point is, even though I would not call Cisco and Dax the greatest BFFs in Star Trek, they will always hold a special place in my heart because they enabled me to pinpoint precisely why I consider Deep Space Nine to be my favorite Star Trek show. And it happened during an episode that kind of sucks. Meridian. The one where Dax falls in insta-love with a dude who lives on a planet that exists on two planes of existence and only shifts into our universe for several days at a time every 60 years. Not a great episode. The romance between Dax and that dude feels rushed and contrived, and I never really buy that Dax loves this guy so much after knowing him for less than two weeks that she's willing to leave the rest of her life behind to hang out with him on his weird-ass planet that can't even make up its mind what universe it wants to be in. But be that as it may, there is one moment in this otherwise forgettable episode that works for me. It's the moment when Sisko visits Dax in her cabin aboard the Defiant to say goodbye. Sisko opens with a bit of a joke, saying Dax is probably the first person to ever ask Starfleet for a 60-year leave of absence. Then he asks her if she's sure this is what she wants to do. She says it is, and asks him to be happy for her. Sisko says he is happy for her, but it's just that I'm going to miss you, old man. And Dax says to Sisko, you've been my friend across two lifetimes. And I can't imagine what it's going to be like not having you around. This is a scene in the middle of a crummy episode built on a premise I do not buy for a second. This is the eighth episode of season three. Ain't no way a series regular is going to up and leave the show like this. Joss Whedon ain't writing this shit. I know all along that something is going to happen that will have Dax on the Defiant on her way back to Deep Space Nine with the rest of the crew by the end of the episode. And yet, Sisko and Dax's farewell scene works for me. Why? Not because I buy into the episode, not because I buy into the premise, but because I buy into the characters. I believe in their friendship. I believe, when I watch the show, that these people really care about each other, that they believe they're saying goodbye, and that they are sad about it and are going to miss each other. A while back, I did a full rewatch of Deep Space Nine, and when I got to this episode and that scene, it clicked, and I realized with full clarity for the first time, that's the reason I love this show so much. Because I believe these characters really care about each other. And that, in turn, unlocked the broader insight that that's the reason I love a lot of the shows I love. Not all of them. There are lots of reasons to love a TV show or a movie, but for some of the ones that are closest to my heart, like Deep Space Nine, that's the reason. So yeah, going back through all the different Star Trek shows and movies and picking out the BFFs and remembering their adventures and their heartwarming moments, that's fun. But it also reminds me of why I give a shit about any of this stuff in the first place. Everything Star Trek has tried to tell us and teach us over the years the value of exploration and imagination, the importance of tolerance and open-mindedness, the necessity of fighting for justice and equality and inclusion. It all comes back to being better people and making this a better world for ourselves and for the ones we care about. Imagine the world your BFF deserves to live in and do what you can to build that world. That's what Data and Geordi would do for each other and Spock and Kirk and Pike in number one, and O'Brien and Bashir, and Rutherford and Tendi, probably, if you could drag them away from their models. Nerds.
Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are TNK, thanks TNK. Adrian Torres, thanks Adrian. Miss Erin T, thanks Miss Erin T. August Halter, thanks August. Jordan Harpole, thanks Jordan. Becky Sparks, thanks Becky. Allison Scott, thanks Allison. Stephen Woods, thanks Stephen. Gigi, thanks Gigi. Rebecca Kennard, thanks Rebecca. Stony Bear, thanks Stony. Tony Fanchi, thanks Tony. Sterling, thanks Sterling. Luke Moran, thanks Luke. Patrick Flaherty, thanks Patrick. Jake HD in Memoriam, thanks Jake. Scott Eck, thanks Scott. Rusty Ronan, thanks Rusty Ronan. Alan Carr, thanks Alan. Thomas Mundar, thanks Thomas. Muchacho Jones, gracias muchacho. Tay Narin, thanks Tay Narin. And now for the new channel members. They are Capable Glober, thanks Capable Glober. Captain Nemo 563, thanks Captain Nemo 563. Ken Schmidt, thanks Ken. Joseph Avens, thanks Joseph. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, it'll be February, the month of Valentine's Day, the month of love. Also Black History Month, because us white people had to screw over the black folks by making their month the shortest one, but that's neither here nor there. Since next month is Valentine's Day, and next month's Trek Actually video will be released on Valentine's Day, I thought it would be nice to do something appropriate, so I loaded up the poll with romantically themed topics, and my wonderful Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members voted, and they chose who are actually Star Trek's best and worst couples. So many to choose from. Writing that one after writing this one will feel like deja vu all over again. That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.